New MacBooks just landed, 83 of them to be exact. I got my hands on three of these configurations in an M3, M3 Pro, and M3 Max so that I can run through the gauntlet of developer tests. Now using the Apple website can be a labyrinth, but I'm here to simplify things. We'll cut through the noise and look at processor power, performance, metrics, pricing, and real value for developers in general. Specs for each machine are down below, but the most important thing is that it has a new space black color. And the fact that it's covered with this, this fingerprint resistant anodization process. It's supposed to be fingerprint resistant now. Everybody was complaining about the Midnight MacBook Air color. That one definitely has fingerprints on it. But it looks like Apple might have been right. Even my greasy fingers clean up pretty nice. First off, about these new M3 family of chips, which I've already covered, but now we've got a little more information about them and I've already started testing them. More to come. But if you're new to Apple Silicon, this chip design is called SOC or System on Chip. By the way, I'll be explaining a few things here because some people are new to this stuff. The System on Chip has performance CPU cores and efficiency cores and GPU cores and Apple Neural Engine cores. And it also has memory built into the chip. This is all a double-edged sword. It's seamless integration, which yields higher performance. But if you're getting a MacBook Pro with one of these chips in it, you'll have to pick one of the 83 available machines and you won't be able to upgrade later. Oh, and uh, I compiled the sheet because I didn't see anything else like it. So I'll link to it down in the description for you to check out and peruse yourself. You'll be able to do cool things like filtering all the models by chip, price, P-core counts, RAM, SSD size, and so on. Enjoy. The most important speed gain over PC counterparts is that memory is on the chip. This makes memory access insanely fast. CPU cores and GPU cores both share this memory, so you don't run into GPU memory bottlenecks like you do when doing machine learning training, for example, on a PC, where you need a $6,000 graphics card just to train a larger model. My prior video put Apple Silicon head-to-head -head with an NVIDIA RTX series board showcasing the differences. Link down below. The one SoC that really seems to have stirred the pot this time around, especially in the memory and CPU core configuration, is the M3 Pro. First of all, it comes with the unusual 18 and 36 gigabyte options, both of which are going to be great for most software development tasks. But the memory speed though, up till now, the trend was doubling or more than doubling the bandwidth of the memory, going from the M1 to the M1 Pro, and then from the M2 to the M2 Pro. But going from the M3 to the M3 Pro, it's only 50% fast. And of course, all the M1 Max, M2 Max, and M3 Max chips have an insane 400 gigabyte per second bandwidth. Uh, this is Passmark memory test and it evaluates the speed and overall performance of a computer's RAM, checking how fast the memory can read, write, and copy data. And here we've got the M3 at 3,677, M3 Pro at 4,720 and the M3 Max at 5,447. Now about the M3 Pro, many of you are showing interest in that, especially during the live stream we did the other day, probably because the M1 Pro and the M2 Pro were such great middle of the line machines. But here the M3 Pro is a bit odd this time around when it comes to CPU cores as well as memory. And I specifically broke down the CPU cores, not just with a big number, but I broke them down into P cores, which are performance cores, and E cores, which are efficiency cores, because it matters here, especially for software developers. They do different things. Performance-wise, P-Cores are typically responsible for handling more demanding tasks and workloads. These are crucial for compiling code and running complex algorithms. E-Cores, on the other hand, while less important than P-Cores for heavy tasks, they're still useful for background tasks and can contribute to overall system stability and responsiveness and energy efficiency. These are important things when it comes to being mobile. So not only does the M3 Pro MacBook Pro have less memory bandwidth, it also seems to have dialed back the CPU cores department as well, featuring six P cores compared to the previous generation's M2 Pro's eight P cores. And on the bin model that I have right here is down to five P cores. But let's not jump to conclusions just yet. It's not all about core count. The efficiency matters too here, and I'll be putting this machine through its paces and seeing how those numbers translate to real world performance also. When it comes to making a decision about purchasing one of these MacBook Pros with the M3 Pro in it, you just have to ask yourself if you want 
want to spend the extra money on the newest and shiniest machine or save a few bucks to get the previous generations and get similar performance. Now for the base M3, the core count actually remains the same as previous generation. The only significant bump here comes to the M3 Max chip, where it went up to 16 cores total with 12 of them being P cores. More on the M3 Max in a bit. Now you've seen Geekbench a lot, probably on all the different channels, including my own. Geekbench 6 tests and scores a computer's speed and power by doing tasks similar to what users do every day. It gives you two scores, a single core score for how the CPU does one thing at a time and a multi-core score for how it does many things at once. JavaScript running in a browser window would be a single core operation and compiling rust.net or Swift app would be a multi-core operation. And here are the Geekbench 6 CPU results for the M3, M3 Pro, M3 Max mixed in with previous results for the M1 and the M2 series. Overall, the M3 series is showing a nice improvement in Geekbench scores. The one thing that makes the new chips hit ridiculously high Geekbench scores is that they use the 3 nanometer process nodes instead of 5 nanometers that the M1s and the M2s had. This packs a lot more transistors into the SoC, if we can even call these transistors anymore. They're so tiny, it just feels wrong calling them that. I remember playing with a transistor in high school electronics class and I could actually hold one in my hand and see it and now I can have a million of them in my hair and I wouldn't even know about it. This is speedometer 2.1. This measures the responsiveness of web apps by simulating user interactions and scoring the browser's ability to manage these tasks. This is running in Safari. These numbers are absolutely insane. I've never even seen numbers like this before. <laughs> I ran it multiple times, and it's funny that the scale goes up to 140. Maybe they should increase the scale at this point. Jetstream 2 is another test I do here pretty often. It tests how fast a browser can run complex web tasks, including JavaScript, but also WebAssembly and other advanced workloads and stress tests. It's different from Speedometer in that it checks how quickly a browser responds to user actions on web pages. And here are the Jetstream 2 results for these three machines. You can see that the M3 does really well here, beating out the M3 Pro. Why do these matter for developers when the end user might be looking at their web app on a 3G Nokia? Well, for the DX, of course, it's all about the developer experience. That's why we're here. All right, no doubt that the biggest update for this new family of chips has to do with the GPU. This is going to be super important for game developers and machine learning engineers. This is the first Apple Silicon chip to have ray tracing. Ray tracing simulates the travel and interaction of light in a scene, leading to more realistic images, and it's built into the hardware itself. So game developers and 3D artists will be able to take advantage of this advanced visual rendering in real time. I imagine it'll be available through uh, some API I haven't played around with it yet. But if you have, let me know down in the comments. And you also might have seen this pretty animated chart, if you can call it a chart. It's an animation from Apple's event referring to its new dynamic caching. But what the heck does that mean? To put it simply, dynamic caching makes sure that memory is used efficiently, allocating just the right amount for each task instead of over allocating memory like it used to do in the M1 and the M2 series. You did notice that the M2s and the M1s were over allocating, right? Did you? I didn't, but now we know. <laughs> Sometimes Apple improves things that nobody complains about, which is a good thing. Now, speaking of the GPU, I also ran MotionMark. This is a benchmark that evaluates a browser graphic performance by measuring its ability to render complex visual motions and smooth animations. And for some reason, the M3 Pro actually won this one, uh, not even the M3 Max. I don't know, it's odd. Geekbench also provides a metal test, which uh, measures the graphic performance of a device using Apple's metal API. Here are the results for that. You can see that the M3 Max really pulls away from the competition uh, by a long shot. And here's how the new M3 family stacks up against the previous generation. Now, one important component is not part of the SOC. So far, we've talked only about the SOC, but you still have to add this to your cart and it's the SSD size, the storage. Now, no matter what you choose here, the SSD SSD will be a good one and it's going to be plenty fast. Here's the disk speed of my M2 Max 2 terabyte SSD and here's the new M3 Max 2 terabyte SSD. As expected, the higher config SSD was faster. Nothing we haven't seen before in the M1s and the M2s. They're just slightly faster in the M3s now. 
So what about the M3 Max? Why is it so much more expensive? Well, besides some of the results you've just seen, it's got a huge transistor density, 92 billion transistors. It's the highest so far in any chip that is not an ultra chip, M1 Ultra or M2 Ultra. Besides the CPU and GPU core counts, which really set it apart, the memory bandwidth is much higher on these as well. The multi-core Geekbench results speak for themselves here with the M3 Max getting nearly the same scores as the M2 Ultra. Ultra. Apple really wants to set this apart as a premium chip in a premium machine. I think they've driven a little bit of a wedge between these machines to kind of really separate this one out. So if you want an upgrade, if you would really want a big upgrade, you're going to go with a bigger one. But um, there is one model of the M3 Max that actually stands out, and I'll get to that in a minute. Let's talk about RAM for a moment. People are complaining, as people do, about the machine that is $1,600. That's this machine and it has only eight gigabytes of RAM. And this criticism often comes from PC users. I found a post from F-Stoppers that captures this sentiment pretty well. The author of the post is a PC user that's just getting into Macs. And many folks don't realize that not only are you getting a premium machine for that money, more premium machines that most PCs you'll get up to $2,500. You're also getting Mac OS's super efficient memory management, more efficient than Windows, which means that even eight gigabytes can be sufficient, especially for most developers. I can't believe I'm saying this, but my brutal memory test video provides evidence of this. I'll link to that video in the description just below the like button. Now with dynamic caching in the picture, the GPU can work even more efficiently by avoiding unnecessary memory swaps to storage. So in other words, in theory, the eight gigabyte machine on an M3 will go even further than the eight gigabytes on an M2 to be determined. So my channel primarily serves software developers, but I've been getting a lot of questions from video editors too. And since I do both things, I'll tell my video editing friends this. Performance scales with price. The lower price, the more patience you're going to need. When you're shopping, select the highest model in the cart, M3 Max MacBook Pro with the highest specs, and then start cutting away until the price fits your budget. Start with the SSD first. Now I will have more details for software development related tests going forward so make sure you subscribe to see those and make sure to like this video if you found it helpful so far but in general here are some thoughts if you were looking at purchasing the m2 macbook air then this base model m3 macbook pro is actually a no-brainer also if you're coming from intel max or the pc ecosystem then the most bang for the buck under a thousand dollars in my opinion is still the good old m1 macbook air uh, if I find a good deal on it, I'll leave it in the description. But getting in at any level of Apple Silicon will give you massive advantages, whether it's in performance or in battery life. Now, to determine which configuration machines offer the most value for software developers, we need to consider a typical workload and requirements for the general developer and match these with insights from the data. Let's look at the CPU performance first. Development often involves compiling code, running servers, and executing tasks which can benefit from strong CPU performance particularly multi-core performance for parallel tasks. As far as memory, developers often run multiple applications simultaneously. You've got tons of Chrome browsers open. You've got IDEs, virtual machines, Docker, databases. All these require a lot of RAM. So make sure you got plenty of that. That's important. Fast SSDs can significantly reduce load times and speed is important for quick access to files, but it doesn't play a huge role in build times as uh, I've done in one of my videos. I covered that. RAM is definitely a more important thing if you need to put your money somewhere. GPUs. Unless the development work involves graphic processing, gaming, or machine learning tasks that can leverage GPU acceleration, a high-end GPU may not be necessary for you. The one thing that I run into a lot is people that use multiple external screens. And you can see that the M3 base model only has support for one external screen. So making that a total of two. You can always use a display link adapter to add more. I have a video on that. The M3 Pro is gonna support more displays, three. And the M3 Max is gonna support four external displays if you really need that. And I think that's why a lot of software developers are landing on the Pro versions of the chips because of that 
that external display requirement that they have. But for general development work, my top picks are categorized into three. Best overall value, best value under $3,000, and best value under $2,000. And actually, I was a little surprised. For the overall value, it's pretty clear that even though Apple charges a ridiculous price to upgrade the RAM and storage, the more you get, the less you pay per gigabyte. So the full-blown spec technically offers the most value. But we're not here for that, right? The next category is best value under $3,000. And there are quite a lot under $3,000, but one stands out in particular. It's this lonesome M3 Max right over here. And it's the only M3 Max SKU that slid under the radar and made it under $3,000. It's not without sacrifice though. You'll only get a 512 SSD with it, but at least it has plenty of RAM and you're getting that super duper chip. Next is the under $2,000 category. Now, if we look at only the M3 family and imagine that the M1 and the M2 family never happened, then the M3 Pro is a clear winner here for bang for the buck. And the bind variety, according to the data, that's the one with the five P cores. It packs enough punch with its 11 core CPU for all your coding needs, comes with a generous 18 gigabytes of RAM, which is more than adequate for most development tasks, running virtual machines, databases, IDEs. It's a smaller SSD, but it will hold your applications and virtual machine files. You just might need to hook up an external Thunderbolt 4 drive to save your work off, which is a pain, but it's not too bad. It's much cheaper than the initial Apple tax. You'll pay for a larger drive in your basket. Now, if we're in the real world, which we are in, M1 Pro and the M2 Pro still exists. And these previous generation can be had for a good price secondhand. If I find some good deals, I'll put some in the description. Another great option, which I just recently tried in this video right over here, is to buy last year's model from Apple themselves at a discount through their certified refurbished store. So check this video out next, and I'll see you in the next one.